Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. The title of today's message is Dedication Day. Dedication Day. The celebration of God's faithfulness is a theme that is woven throughout the entire Bible. That our God, loved ones, is good and our God is faithful. We've been enjoying this study in Nehemiah together. We're seeing the value of godly leadership, the blessing of faithful workers at every level in the work of God. When God's people come together and they see the goodness of God. They see what God accomplishes through their hands and their feet and their lives that they could never accomplish on their own, but God. And he does wonderful things. These people in Nehemiah have dealt with all types of resistance and conflict, and the Lord sustained them every step of the way. In our text today, we come back to Nehemiah's account. We've been in a, in a, since chapter 7, here's Ezra's list. But now we come back to the first person in Nehemiah's record. And now it's time to dedicate the work, the finished work, the construction project that was done. And there was an interlude that was very important to get to of the work that, that needed to be done on the hearts and in lives. Now we come to this spiritual, this amazing day, and it's a dedication day where they they will dedicate the gates. They will dedicate the walls to the one who saw fit to do it all. We love child dedications, right? We love when families have another new one on the way. By the way, there is another new one on the way with this couple right here. There's another one, another bun in the oven. So we didn't, you were supposed to have a child to dedicate, and then I can just spill the news, you know, right here in a dedication. I've done that before. Oh, big open mouth insert foot. That was, that was the Patiglios. They forgave me graciously. Uh, told everybody, like, okay, I guess we're going to tell everybody. But I got permission, all right? So I got permission. Uh, Ethan and Kat have told their family, and so another one is on the way, and praise the Lord for life all ages of life. Do you know, I think that's one of my most favorite things when we come together for whatever we come together for is all ages. It's all ages just crying together, laughing together. This is what the church is to be. So we rejoice with the blounts in the bun in the oven on the way, all right? This is, this is great. We're thankful when parents stand before a congregation. What are they saying? They're saying, this is a gift from the Lord. We're dedicating this child to the one who gave us this child. The the Lord is one. When does life begin? It seems that no one can figure this out, no matter how many PhDs they have behind their name. Life begins at conception. That's, That's always the question, loved ones. What are we talking about in the womb, what is it? It's life. It's precious. And so those of you that have gone through the all miscarriages, why is that difficult? And why is there sorrow? Because it's the value of life. And so we rejoice with those who rejoice and often those who go through miscarriages, they, they mourn alone. That's not, that's not the best. Nor are we weighing in on telling everybody how they should grieve, but we want to say loudly, we are here with you, and we aren't you and can't go through that with you, but we love you, and this is what family is. It's not just the good picture moments. It's also the difficult moments in life. We're here, and God is there when everybody else gets in their car and they go their way. God remains. Thank the Lord for that. Dedication day. 
The foundation of the temple was laid. That's back in Ezra chapter 3, if you want to write that down. When they laid the foundation after it had been destroyed, that's when the cheer went. I think I've actually said it was when the dedication of the temple, but it wasn't. It was when they dedicated the foundation of the temple. That's when the older people were crying. The younger people were rejoicing. And you couldn't quite tell the sound. Keep that in mind, because today we're going to get to the dedication of the walls and of the gates, and there's no confusion on what is the sound that is coming from these people. It's all joy. It's all rejoicing. The, the second rebuilt temple, the rebuilt temple by Zerubbabel, that's in Ezra chapter 6. Now we fast forward about 14 years and here we examine what happened when Nehemiah and the people of God dedicated their work to the Lord for his glory. Remember, they're preparing to welcome Messiah. He will come. He will come to the holy city. He will come to the city, and it's not ready, so we have to get the walls fixed. We need to get the gates fixed. We need to get our hearts and lives fixed. So by the enabling of the Holy Spirit, we will seek together to apply the truths and the principles that we learn from this last part of Nehemiah chapter 12 today, applying them individually to our lives and corporately as a church family. This morning, we want to see this, four right responses to the goodness of God. We have sung songs this morning that direct our hearts to we've waited for this day. Okay, so these songs have been chosen specifically because these people, all 2,500 years ago, they were waiting for this day. They were gathered and they were excited. They were thrilled at what God had done and how he had worked through them. So there are four right responses. And the first right response that we see in, in Nehemiah 12 is this. It's a detailed preparation. It's a detailed preparation. Now, recently, we have had a graduation celebration. We had a wedding a year ago. We had a wedding yesterday, and I will attest to there is a lot of work that goes into these events when you are welcoming people. When you are gathering, it's not just about the person or the people. It's about the guests who are coming as well to receive them well, and it is all done to the honor and glory of God and to the joy of his people. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. Well, so it goes in this day. If you follow along there it'll, in your Bibles, verse 27, Nehemiah chapter 12. We're going to read through verse 30. And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings, and with singing with cymbals, harps, and lyres. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the districts around, surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the Nef Netophites. <laughs> A district, uh, let's see, verse 29. Also from Beth Gilgal and from the region of Geba and Asmeth, Asmeth. For the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates of the wall. There's a lot of preparation here. It's detailed preparation. So what do we apply to our own lives is, loved ones, we need to get ready. All right, we see from them there was a detailed preparation. For us, what is a right response to the goodness of God? Get ready. Get prepared. Expect God to do great things. We see here the importance of gathering. Don't miss out. They went out and they sought after the Levites in all of their places to bring them to Jerusalem. There's an importance here and they didn't want them to miss this day. It was a special occasion and all of the Levites were sent for. They called them all up this is the big leagues. Let's, let's get here today. This is the time. Call them. Go send for them. Get them. The rotation of temple ministers was set up. They would serve two weeks out of the year. So two weeks out of 52 would be their rotation. But for this occasion, they said, go get everybody. Bring everybody. We're all, all hands on deck is another way to say this. The rest of the year, the other 50 weeks of the year, what were these priests and Levites responsible to do? They were to be fathers, husbands, 
They were to take Deuteronomy 6, teach their families, rear their families, be concerned and concentrated on what God was doing in and through them and their families. But on this occasion, everyone was called for. Get to Jerusalem. Be part of what God has done through his people. And he's even used a foreign king, so you don't want to miss this day. This gathering was going to be huge. It was going to be unthinkable for anybody to miss this day. So they went out and they gathered everybody, even the sons of the singers, gathered together. Music plays an important part of corporate and private worship. So loved ones, don't underestimate. Don't underestimate the importance of gathering for worship on a regular basis. There's so many times when things happen in the family of God, like when Thomas missed the first time Jesus showed up, and somebody says, ah, I wasn't there. Oh, I was out over here. I was out over there. Once again, we see, as we see throughout Old Testament and New Testament, the importance of coming together, being together as the people of God, actually seeing people and being connected in the body of Christ. Now, I'll say this. The, the uh, Sunday night, July 10th, 6 o'clock, we're going to gather for a prayer meeting down at the property. We're in the building program. You see the, the money, the funds God is supplying. They're coming in. But we're also coming out of this pandemic. We're coming out of supply chain crisis. We're coming out of all of these things, building costs. You're aware of all of these things. For it to go forward, the Lord is going to have to do some supernatural, amazing things. And he's actually done that for us all all our life, we just sang that. He's been faithful. We're simply saying, God, we want to see this again. We have to see this again. We can't just will this to be done, unless you can. If you can write the check, then write the check. Wonderful. God will use you. But otherwise, we're going to pray and see God's face. And even if you do write a check, we're going to say, thank you, God, for supplying the need. You're sufficient, and you supplied. It's how he always works. That's what they're doing here. And they gather, and they weren't gathering to say, where's my my plaque for my section of the wall I did? Where's my applause for what I did on the gate over there? I fixed this buckle right here. Now, was that true? Yes. But who supplied the ability and the knowledge and the know-how to be able to do that? The Lord did. So who gets the glory at the end of the day for anything we do good? The Lord. So we trust him in this. There's an environment here in this text of victory importance of gathering, yes, but look at the environment as we see this. There's a response here of worship. They were, they were going to celebrate. They were going to dedicate. There was gladness. There were thanksgivings. There's singing. Now, I'll tell you something. I don't know if you noticed. We have a few families out of town this week, and they're the families that bring the energy, all right, in, in the church. There's a few of them. They're out. If you're watching online, we're missing you this morning, and other people were like, wait a second. Something's changed. There's some people that usually clap and they celebrate and they're not here. It doesn't feel a little different. I was cracking up up here. I'm like, hey, we're missing. Oh, yeah, they're out of town. They're celebrating. They're with their families. They're on vacation. This is an environment of victory. And some of you are, are big-time sports fans. And when your team wins, you celebrate. When your team loses, we won't talk about that, all right? There's other things that happen, and you're just mad and upset. But when celebration happens, you know how to celebrate. Look at what we see here. There's gladness. It's overflowing, this quality of joy that abides in every season, that the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah 8.10, is our strength. Listen to Psalm 81.1. This is a psalm of Asaph. Listen to what the word of God says. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. So if you're ever here and then you hear Someone from unusually about that back row back there say, whoa! Like, Can you do that? Right there is the text. Shout to God. I mean, he, there's an excitement here, 1 Peter 1.8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Okay, so we sang that song this morning. There's glory on our face. We're looking to the sky. Open up the heavens. When these people gathered on this day, there was an atmosphere of victory. 
They had seen, and this is what we long for our children to see, that we just don't read of, we do, but we just don't read of God's faithfulness in the Old Testament. We read of God's faithfulness in the New Testament, but they're able to say, hey, grandfather, tell me how God provided and how God was faithful to you. Hey, dad, hey, mom, will you tell me of God's faithfulness? And then they're able to say, I put some coins in a bucket next door. And I was able, and the Lord enabled, he allowed us to build a work. He allowed us to partner with missionary partnerships around the world. And I saw God do miraculous things in my lifetime. That's one generation to the next generation to the next generation. Gladness, thanksgivings, singing, Melody, lyrics, all communicated through our lips. Ephesians 5, 19, Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he wrote to the Colossians almost the same thing. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. He writes to the Colossians, unless somebody says, well, yeah, but that was for the Ephesians. You know, they needed that. Everybody else, they can just do their own thing. No, no, no. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is why often, not always, but often after a sermon, we respond in worship, in singing, because it's the congregation saying, we add our voice to this and we worship together. The instruments of music, they're noted here appropriate instruments for celebration that were in accordance with and linked to King David's musical abilities. King David loved God. He loved God-centered worship. I loved when I was on two different mission trips just in, uh, just in comparison. Uh, Ginger and I, we, we went with our youth group, we went to, to Mexico. And it was interesting in that particular mission trip, it sounded like we were just in American churches in Mexico. It was very, very unusual. I was kind of surprised. Very different when I went to India, when we gathered in all of the different places where there's a center of training, a church, the place where the pastor lives. In each of those places, they brought out instruments that are native to the Indian culture. They were foreign to me. They were different to me. But there I was sitting with brothers and sisters in Christ, and they were singing music that was familiar to them, but the lyrics were different. And after they would sing, then Isaac, I have it all on video, he would explain, here's what they were singing. And how much of the music they were singing was looking to the sky, looking for the return, looking for the redemption of Christ, praising him for his blood and his burial and his resurrection. We see cymbals, harps, and lyres. This is percussion. This is, this is a symphony of praise. This is volume. This is going to get someone's attention. It's funny. Uh, a family came up and visited us, and their son shares a birthday with Sophie. And when she turned, I think it was two years old, we still lived in the parsonage next door. And do you know the gift that this young man gave to Sophie on this birthday shared? Some shoes. Those are fine. But he gave her one of those drum sets that you get at uh, CVS. You know, not the nice ones, the real tinny ones that are just loud. And I was, I was thinking, thanks, Jared. I really appreciate that. This is like a grandparent gift. Bye. Enjoy the gift. And they're gone. And there's Sophie making noise. But it turned out okay. It turned out all right, you know. Uh, the Lord turned what, what was, I thought was meant for evil for me has turned to good, you know. So that worked out okay. Thank you, Jared. Wonderful gift. Psalm 150. Listen to this. A psalm of praise. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with the loud clashing cymbals. Read the last verse with me. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And in case we miss the point of the psalm, Praise the Lord. Like, this is volume. This is fitting. I mean, there's a reason why we laugh at the golf clap. You know, that's golf. You don't do that at the stadium. 
you know. Kick him out. Revoke his season tickets. Get him out of here. He doesn't understand. Wrong idea. That's for just a, a ball. And we're coming back under the word remembering our God is good. Our God is faithful. That might bring a shout every now and then. There's the requirement now of purification. So with all of this joy and all of this wonder, and there's victory and there's music and they've gathered together, but hold on a second. We have to remember the God that we are serving. And we can't just come walking in on our own. We can't come walking in on our own accomplishments, but we must be covered and washed by blood. Don't you enjoy purified things when you're taking them in your body? You don't really want to just go scoop this out of any puddle anywhere and say, eh, it's water. It's all the same. You know, it's water. When we were in India, Isaac was very careful with us so then we would not, he's like, you can't handle our, our tap water. And we were on the Ganges River, five in the morning. He's like, don't touch the water. You can't handle it. The pollution that's in the water, and you could see it coming from out of Varanasi down into the water. When we're taking something into our bodies, we want it to be purified. We want it to be cleansed. Now think about this. If we care about what comes into our body, how much more would God, who is holy, care about how his people approach him? We must be purified. We must be cleansed. This is the holy city. And so before they just carry on and go on in and do their thing, they pause, they stop, and they say, hold on a second. We've been studying the word for a reason, and there needs to be a step of purification. Often that's connected with animal sacrifice, sprinkling of blood. It's also water, washing of water. There were different uh, basins around the tabernacle, around the temple, where they would wash ceremonially, but be clean. You need to be clean before you come into the presence of the Lord to be clean. Repentance. This is the holy city. One writer says it this way, the process of purification included Ritual bathing and shaving, putting on clean garments, fasting, abstaining from sexual intercourse, and offering sacrifices. It it was a pause on life. Everything about life, hold on. Even the good things, all the good things that God has given to us, but stop and let's remember the Lord and we need to be purified as we go into his service. So the leaders purified themselves The leaders purified the people, and then the leaders purified the gates and the walls. This was the completed work. So they started. This is where it always begins. It has to begin with self. Then it goes out to the people, and there's the work that's impacted by this. You know how easy it is to get this backwards? Especially for me as a a pastor. Uh, what do we have to do? Get the to-do list, get the things done. We've got the other thing. And, and, then, and then this is what the people, and if the people will, you know, here's what you need to do, attendance and, and prayer and, and evangelism and all those, you know, wonderful five things. And we, they need to do this. And then, oh, by the way, have I thought about this for myself? Uh, yes. You know how easy it is to get that backwards? Instead of beginning with self, preaching the gospel again to my own heart, bringing that then to people, and then letting that reach out and make an impact to the world, to the community around us. Well, how are we purified? Ephesians 5, 26, a passage very familiar to wedding goers, all right? Paul writing about Christ's love for his church, husband, bride, Christ is the, the groom and the church is his bride. And what does it say? Ephesians 5, 26, that he, Christ, might sanctify her, the church. How does this happen? Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That it's the word of God that washes over us, tearing down what is wrong and building up what is right. Secondly, we see in the next section in this 
passage, unashamed procession. Unashamed procession. So they've gathered, they've prepared, they're ready. They're purified. There's, the volume is getting turned up. They're ready to praise the Lord and they're unashamed. Verse 31 is where we'll pick up. We'll read to verse 42. Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. One went to the south on the wall to the dung gate, and after them went Hoshiah and half of the leaders of Judah, and Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, and certain of the priest's sons with trumpets, Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of Micaiah, son of Zachar, son of Asaph, and his relatives, Shemaiah, Azarel, Melilai, Giliah, Mai, Nethanel, Judah, and Hanai, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra the scribe went before them. Note that, verse 37. At the fountain gate, they went up straight before them by the stairs of the city of David. At the ascent of the wall, above the house of David, to the water gate on the east, the other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north, and I, note this now, followed them with half of the people. On the wall, above the tower of the ovens, to the broad wall, and above the gate of Ephraim, and by the gate of Yeshana, and by the fish gate, and the tower of Henanel, and the tower of the hundred, to the sheep gate, and they came to the halt at, they came to halt at the gate of the guard." So both choirs of those who gave thanks stood in the house of God, and I and half of the officials with me, and the priests, Eliakim, Messiah, Messiah, Minim, Micaiah, Elinoi, Zechariah, and Hananiah with trumpets, and Messiah, Shemaiah, Eliezer, Uzai, Johanan, Melchijah, Elam, and Ezer, and the singer sang with Jezariah there as their leader. We'll stop right there. Go worship. That's our response. Unashamed procession. Hey, where are you going today? Why aren't you going with us here? Why aren't you going with us over there? Because I'm going to worship. It's the Lord's day. What do we see here? Two choirs. There's two choirs. It's one impressive meeting. Two choirs. Nehemiah gathered the leaders of Jerusalem. Remember, some of them had been reluctant to help. Some of them wouldn't stoop to help. They wouldn't shoulder the burden. Now he calls them all together. Many of them were involved. Some of them were not. But nevertheless, they're still part of the people of Israel. All of them come together. He gathers them all. He appointed the two great choirs. What's your purpose? We're going to give praise. We're going to give thanksgiving to God. This is the day he's made. Let us rejoice. Let us be glad in it. And we are going to sing our lungs out. Now, remember what was said early on in Nehemiah? I think it was Tobiah. Yeah, if they build the wall, if a fox goes on it, it's going to fall down. Thanks, Toby. Good job. It was wonderful. Somebody silence him. Do you understand what's happening now? Hey, uh, you watching out there, enemies? We're not just putting a fox or a cat or a little dog up on the walls. We're going to send two massive choirs with trumpets and all kinds of instruments, and it's going to get loud. There's going to be percussion. There's going to be some stomping. There's going to be a massive celebration, and we're not ashamed of it. And we're not going to hide this. It's going up for everybody to see. This is lavish. There's two choirs. There's two directions. There's two directions, and they're going to the same place, one triumphant destination. Now, Ezra, he led the one choir to the south, and that ended up at the temple. And then Nehemiah, the leader, the governor, do you see where he put himself? Not out in front. I am Nehemiah. I'm the king's right-hand man. Here I am, and, and choir fall in behind me. No, he wasn't a priest. 
He didn't have those credentials. So what did he do? This is a sign of a humble leader. He said, you all go ahead. I'm right here with you and I'll follow you. That's a good leader. Not the leader that's always just banging his own drum, how great I am and how wonderful I am. So if you go back for me one screen, here's the directions and it mirrors when Nehemiah went out at night and he did some reconnaissance and he went through and he checked it all out. Now, all of the people, they're going, one's going one direction, one's going the opposite direction. The choirs, all of these people, they're singing and they're looking over, they're walking over the portion of the wall and it's holding them up. It's under their feet. People are watching this unashamed procession. And they're all headed to what will zoom in the temple. This is where we're going. This is why we, this is why we did the construction project. Loved ones, if the Lord allows us and he sees fit to give us a dedication day of our own at the corner of 30 and Forest, it will not be for our own glory. It will not be for our own pomp and circumstance. It will be that we can tell anybody anywhere we go very simply, you can find us, Gratiot and 30 Mile. And everyone, you know this, everyone in the metro area will be able to find a place to worship that comes under the word and responds and prays and worship and is spread and goes forth to tell of the goodness of God. There's people that live in Richmond and are like, your church is where? I've lived in Richmond my whole life. I didn't know you were, you're where? Oh, are you the church of Brick? No, that's not us. And then I have to start narrowing down through the pizza place and the, and the tractor store. Right? There. Oh, I know where that is. The choir directors are there. There's many singers, but there's one worship leader. It's the same spirit that we have of Nehemiah. I, don't, I, I can set people in their place, but I don't have to be the leader. Are you able to follow well? Or do you always follow with comments? You know, well, if I was leading, you know, well, if I was this, well, if I was that. Do you enjoy, if you're a manager, having someone work under you that does that all the time? Nehemiah is a great example of a leader who knows how to fall in line and praise the Lord and join in. Now, Jezariah was the choir leader. He's the worship leader. He's got everything under his you know, remember choir leaders? You know what they would say? Hey, and you know, that's another thing we're planning for is we'll actually be able to have a place, a platform. Uh, Emma was just talking about this. We could have a choir back singing and praise and add voices to the choir. Wouldn't that be, where are they going to stand? Oh, we could do it. We could stand people up on the, on the side, you know. You might hit your head. But there's going to be a place. Here's Jezariah. And what does he say? You know, let them hear you out beyond the walls. And he was being serious. He couldn't say raise the roof because it was a roof. It was all outside. So he's saying, lift your voices and let them hear you all the way back to Persia. And they listened to him. Now, a lot of us guys, anybody take a choir class in uh, middle school? And your choir director said, sing louder. And guys were like, no. <laughs> We've seen the kids' choirs here, right? And what are the, what are the young boys often doing? Like, give me, give me a truck. Give me something I can shoot or break or throw, but sing? This is a men's choir. It's loud, and there's all the families following or down below. There's my dad. There's my grandpa. And you finally can't hear him sing. It's just blended in with everybody else. It's amazing. And they're praising God. Number three, exuberant praise and thanksgiving. Exuberant praise and thanksgiving. There's detailed preparation. There's unashamed in this procession. They're not ashamed. They're serving the living God. And now we see exuberant praise and thanksgiving. They're not holding back. This is lavish. Verse 43, and they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. Why? For God had made them rejoice with great joy and the women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. The joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. It wasn't a, what is that sound? Are people crying? Are people wailing? 
They heard the joy of the holy city, the joy of Jerusalem. So what's our takeaway? Get loud. Isn't it tempting to just say, well, I, you know, I'm not really a great singer. Well, you know, I don't really totally know the song. Well, so I'm just going to, we've gathered in your name, calling out to you. This is a pushback on our pride. This is a call for us to think about who is it that I'm worshiping. Am I more concerned about saving face or the glory of God? This is exuberant praise. This is exuberant thanksgiving. This is a joy that goes out beyond the walls of the city of the people of God. What do we see? Great sacrifices. There were abundant sacrifices offered to the Lord that day. Sacrifices were offered as substitutes by sinners, for sinners. We need a substitute for our sin. It's a somber reality of worship. It's a reminder of God's holiness along with the deadly cost of all of our sin that God made a way for sinners to be reconciled, to be made righteous. It's also a giving to the Lord and to his work out of great thanksgiving and joy. In 1 Kings, the record, they just stopped keeping count when Solomon dedicated the temple. There were so many sacrifices like, you know, one million and two, like, you know, stop counting. We, uh, just keep bringing them. Sacrificing to the Lord when he dedicated the temple. There's great sacrifices here. There's great joy here. And the Bible says that they rejoice because God had made them rejoice with great joy. Their response was worship. They weren't trying to do something to, uh, now God, you owe us. They're responding to God's goodness. They're not trying to attempt to gain God's favor through singing, through worship, through sacrifices. They're responding to him. If, if you remember when David uh, tried to bring the, the, the Ark of the Covenant back into the holy city, and the first time they made a new cart, and they had oxen, and they put the cart, and they're carrying, and they're excited, and then the the oxen stumble and something happens to the cart and a man named Uzzah puts his hand up and he try, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help God out. I'm going to keep God safe and the Lord strikes him dead. He dies right there and David is just upset. He's wrecked. He's mad. And the, how, the, the ark just goes into a, a man's house and it just goes there. We don't know what to do. They, ha, they weren't paying attention to the instructions. And so then through a time of repentance and David comes back to what he should do, they get the instructions out and it's the priests and they're the ones that care. Here's how they do it. And then when they bring it and they bring it to Jerusalem, David is dancing like a maniac in front of the ark of God. He is so overjoyed. He is, he's just filled and overflowing. And in 2 Samuel 6, 22, here's what happens. Saul's daughter, Michael, was looking out the window and she sees him. And there he is making a fool of himself in her eyes. This is a king. My dad never did that. Your dad was an angry, angry man. Tried to kill people all the time. My dad never did. Look at David down there. And she despised him. She she just looked on him like, what is this? She didn't understand what he was doing. Unless we're too hard, too difficult on her. You ever been somewhere and somebody worships differently than you? And you're like, what is this? What are they doing? Hands up. What are they doing? What's that about? Okay, that's her despising David. And she calls him on it. What are you doing out there? Like, you weren't, you weren't wearing enough clothes, Dave. You shouldn't have been doing that. That wasn't very, that wasn't very honorable. And this is David's response to her. He said, I will make myself yet more contemptible, contemptible than this, undignified. And I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. The point out of this is he said, you have your opinion about how I worship. I will even be more undignified than that for the glory of God. I will not care about human opinions. I will care about one, and that will make me the best I need to be for all other human beings, and that is what does God say? 
What is his opinion of me? And that's what David, that's his response. So there's great sacrifices, there's great joy, there's a greater renown. Out of this praise, out of this dedication day, the joy of, the, of Jerusalem was resonating far beyond the walls to peoples far away. And what would they be saying? What, what's going on? What's happening in Jerusalem? Ooh, they did what? Oh, they, they got the gates fixed. They got the walls fixed. That destroyed city? Who went back there? Who would ever want to live there? They went back. They migrated back. This is This is unbelievable. There's choirs there now. There's people living in the city now. There's city life there. Something is happening there. And who's ever heard of this happening? Oh, it's their God. Their God made a way. We exist, loved ones, to know him and to make him known. And that's what these people are experiencing in Nehemiah's day. Our God has done this. And our God has a message and he has salvation for all peoples. And it's coming through this city. Messiah. Now, Psalm 48 is a psalm of the sons of Korah. And listen to how it parallels what we're reading in Nehemiah when they go around and they inspect and praise and sing over all of the walls, over all of the gates, over all of the different locations. Listen to Psalm 48. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Where? In the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation. Okay, so in, in Scripture, J Jerusalem, it just physically, it's, it's up. You went down to Jer Jericho because Jerusalem is elevated. It's up. It's a city that's up. So it says, beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth, not just of Israel. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took the flight. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind, you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. Selah. Stop and think about it. Verse nine. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. As your right hand is filled with righteousness, let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. That's what they're doing on this dedication day. Now listen to this, verse 12. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. Amen? That's what they were doing. So that's why there was an exuberant praise and thanksgiving. And lastly, we see a right response to the goodness of God is generous provision. And this is in verses 44 through 47. On that day, men were appointed over the storerooms, the contributions of the first fruits, first fruits and the tithes, to gather them into the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites, according to the fields of the towns. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered. And they performed the service of their God, and the service of purification, as did the singers and the gatekeepers, according to the command of David and his son Solomon. For long ago in the days of David and Asaph, there were directors of the singers, and there were songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. And all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah gave the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, and they set apart that which was for the Levites, and the Levites set apart that which was for the sons of of Aaron. Well, what's our takeaway here? Give wholeheartedly. That's what we see, is that Nehemiah has picked up and he sees, this is a great day. People's hearts are moved. Give wholeheartedly. That's our right response. And so he's saying, then we need to take all of our songs and all of our praise the Lord's and all of our, our God is awesome and a wonderful God, and it needs to, it needs to supply for his work, and let's do this right now. Let's respond with our giving right now. 
So God's work demands wise administration. So there's leadership and there's people placed into the right places. Men were appointed on that day. You see that? He's not waiting like, well, tomorrow, let's come back and get this done. He says, oh, no, 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 no. Right now, and notice he's not providing for himself. That's what politicians love to do. They love to provide for themselves. He's providing for the work of God. He is showing love and care for the priests and the Levites and the work of God in the temple. And he's saying, everybody, it's time to respond in sacrificial giving and care for these spiritual leaders of Israel. And let's start, not tomorrow, let's start today, right now, on that day. Nehemiah wasted no time. Men were appointed over the storerooms, right? He's, he's just going back. What does David say? What did Solomon say? What's the plan? Where, where are all this? How are we supposed to give? Men were appointed over the storerooms. Men were appointed over the contributions. Men were assigned to dividing up the portions. Here's for the priests. Here's for the Levites. Men were performing ministry of purification. There were men who led in the music ministry as singers. There were men who were gatekeepers. It was all of it. All right, we got the ushers. We got the security. We got the singers. We got the people. We got all these people. And all of it has to be provided for. So rest of the people, you're connected to the worship of God through giving and through presence. And so he just says, on that day. Let's do it. Let's get it done right. Uh, another spoiler alert, chapter 13 is going to let us down. Because all of that wonderful, you know, experience, and a week later, and a month later, and a year later, and it's like, well, I had some bills come up. You know, the inflation, you know, just inflation and whatever. God's faithfulness deserves great celebration. God, his faithfulness deserves great celebration. Don't hold back from adding your voice, your song, your praise to the song of the redeemed. They celebrate these singers. Psalm 47 verse 1 says, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. Psalm 66 1, shout for joy to God all the earth. Hey, we're his people. How is the rest of the earth going to ever? They don't know who is this God. When they hear his people shout to him and our lives match this, we're to be salt and light. Psalm 81, one, sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. It's a little uncomfortable, isn't it? But there's scripture and he's worthy. Let's celebrate him. God's word commands supreme devotion, and that is always connected to sacrifice. Sacrifice is inextricable from worship. Remember when Abraham was going to offer his son? And he said, I'm, I'm going to worship. That's what he told the man. Well, I'm going to worship, and my son and I will be back. He didn't know how, but he knew God has made a promise, and we're coming back. I don't know how he's going to do it, but we're going to worship. Worship is always connected to sacrifice. So give to the Lord your heart. That's where it always begins. Loved ones, if you are here and you have never given your life, you've never surrendered to the Lord, that's where it begins. We sang that song, I give you all my life. I'm letting it go. And if you have never proclaimed that to the Lord, that's where it begins, not with writing a check, not with giving through an app. It's giving your heart and life, admitting I'm a sinner and I trust in Jesus here. And he will take you and forgive you and adopt you and redeem you and make you a joint heir with Jesus Christ, the king of all the earth. That might have been a good place for a shout, right? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm with him. He chose me. This is amazing. I don't deserve to be there. Matthew 16, 26, Jesus says this. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? I don't know, Pastor, you're asking me a lot. To give my life? 
to give my heart, to give my future, to give everything, my family, to Christ? Corey Fifield, no. I, I respect you, but no. I have to, I'm gonna go make money. And the Lord chased him down and saved his soul. And now he lives to plant works around the world of men proclaiming the same message. What does Paul say to the Christians in Corinth about their giving? Encouraging them? 2 Corinthians 9, 6. The point is this. Get to the point. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap how? Whoever sows sparingly, let's try this again, choirs, okay? To the north and to the south. All right, whoever sows sparingly will also reap. Oh, that was good. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap. Okay. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound to you. Okay, so health, wealth, and prosperity messages, they, they, they turn this the whole thing around and make it all about you give to get. No, no, you give and we get grace. We give because of grace. It's all God's grace. We give in response to his grace according to our ability, not according to what somebody else tells us. God, what would you have me to give? And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things, that at all times you may abound in every good work. And then he wraps up this with verse 15. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. I can't even describe it to you. How do I give back to the Lord? I give in light of his indescribable, inexpressible gift. Lord, I give back to you. And that's how we give. Four right responses. Detailed preparation, unashamed procession, exuberant praise and thanksgiving, generous provision. What's our application? Loved ones, get ready. Loved ones, go worship. When we sing, go ahead, get loud. Turn it up a little bit. Give wholeheartedly. Starts with the heart. And after the Lord owns my heart, he gets everything else. It just all comes with it. And he blesses and he gives grace upon grace. Let's stand together. May the Lord give you by his spirit. What is that next step for you? And may you have the courage and the grace to respond in obedience today to that next step. Father, we thank you for your word and your faithfulness and your goodness and your grace and your son. We have nothing apart from him, but in Christ, we have all the inheritance of Christ. We have all the grace that we need because of your inexpressible gift. So Father, bless in such a specific way today that the, someone listening who has never turned from their sin and trusted you, given their heart, their life to you, let today be the day of their salvation, Father, right now, where they cry out to you for salvation. And for those who belong to you, Lord, will you allow us to be renewed in grace that on this day, this dedication day, that we will rededicate, say, Lord, here I am again. I surrender everything to you. And we simply respond, Lord, we thank you. And our lives, we desire, we intend, we pray, will be lived in a right response to you. For the honor and glory of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.